that way so you don't have to be a slave and you'll be happy being a slave and you're going to thank the DNA because why? Well, because you got to experience arguing on YouTube and you know what you screwed an apple pie once I mean what, whatever I mean come on it's addiction that motivates you you're, every bit of your passion is built out of monkey and lizard juice there's no intelligence in any of that you're using your intelligence as a scheming tool to keep an ape and a lizard happy uh, and that's the brain you might believe that we're both attributing the brain to that capacity you know it's adaptable we love the adaptability of the human brain but one of the most amazing things is the things this is adaptable again another wrong word but it's just a wrong word it, the, the, the best part of the brain, okay, outside, there's the, I guess you have to separate these parts. There's this feeling, emotional bullshit thing, and then there's this intelligent thing. And there's nothing about intelligence that should be adaptable to anything but the goddamn truth. It should, that's what it should be adapting to. That's, that should be the passion. And generally speaking, that is the course of intelligence because you can't cover, the truth can't be covered up. It keeps popping up. It keeps revealing itself. The evidence becomes just so dominant that it can't be ignored anymore. And, and so that's, but, but there's always this huge resistance. There's this huge resistance at every level of the truth being revealed. People have kept trying to shove something over, shove some kind of God over that goddamn truth because we can't let that truth be revealed. And you're doing the same thing, in my opinion. This glorification of the human beast, the passion, the, the, the crude, addicted organism is just babble, just nonsense. It's, again, not accepting the fact that we are the, at the core, the source of our existence is an irrational mechanism that reproduces itself without any logical, rational cause. Our purpose, our accomplishment. It's, it's all the things it refuses to adapt to. So, you know, and those things we just have adaptation on a larger time scale, right? Like you refuse to adapt to something over a couple thousand years because you know maybe it'll pass on the 10,000 year level. But something that really comes for millions of years and you just adapt. Maybe it's all adaptation at different levels, but still, you know, on this narrow scope, you know, we have some freedom of thought associated with this brain allowing us to figure these things out. And I think we have that so that freedom of thought again this is you know this is a bogus word this is no freedom of thought okay I mean it wasn't this Edison um, Galileo Benjamin Franklin whoever they all built my conception of the world my perception of the world it wouldn't, my perception would not exist without them I'm not free to be independent of the foundation they create for me to be able to think in a structured and ordered way without language I would be helpless as an intelligence so this is this, there's no freedom here we are constructs and, and that are built by a process um, our environment builds us and, and we will do as our construct has been built to do you will defend because you have some gooey little girly feelings, <laughs> you know, girly man feelings for life, um, you will say the glass is half empty. I, because I have seen harsh, negative, brutal pieces of life and, and have an understanding that there's nothing I can build, that, that we've done this, been there, done that, been there, done that, that all this glory, all this satisfaction we keep feeding on, this is a meal we've already eaten, and it's only because we keep dying that we forget we've already eaten it. And it's silly, because the price we're paying for it is too fucking high. And that's what the distinction between these two brains is this, somehow your brain has been focused on the, the glory of satisfying your addiction, and my brain is now focused on the horrible price paid for this silly, stupid, irrational addiction. To help us survive, and to survive, we're going to have to become more enlightened, more peaceful. And we have to go in, in the direction I'd like to see us go. And, and the nature of the brain, you know, and the DNA, and the need for survival, all contribute to that. They have no play in it at all. Like I said, it's going to be gorillas and lizards. That's the passion. The intelligence is this thing that if you don't have tremendous intellectual discipline, okay, the lizard and the, the ape will use your brain, the rest of your brain, like a fucking hammer. They will use the tool of intelligence to scheme and connive, a way to manipulate and destroy anything in the way of its passion, what it loves, what it has defined as cute, what it cares about because it has a personal relation to, to it. All this subjective crap will rule the fucking individual organism. And as long as individuals are owned by their individuality and not any devoted, principled understanding of their obligation to civilization, there will be no civilization. That need to go in that direction, and, and I think to a certain amount of necessity, in the sense that it's you know kill it or cure it. You know, we either go in that direction or we die out. So you know, now there's, there's there's a conceivable, horrible, more likely road where we will destroy civilization, we will brutalize the human organism, we will sentence it to a harsh, dismal cockroach existence. Um, that's the likelihood. It's going to be hard to exterminate the human race, and so what's going to be left behind is going to be another animal, another dumb, ignorant ape, with with still with AK-47s. Apes with AK-47s. That's what's going to still be on planet fucking Earth. Especially because they, well, we're on the way there, and they, we don't make it in time because we lollygag, or there's enough time left, or whatever. I love the word lollygag. Um, fine, you know. Kind of a girly man word. <laughs> Just joking. That's the destination. If we're going to make it a million years, and by all means, a life form is going to be successful. It should easily be able to make it a million years. And it's hard for us to imagine society. It's kind of society going on a million years, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, let's concede. We've only had uh, developed intelligence for a few hundred years, really, right? I mean, we could say that you know, we've had civilization for 5,000, but it really wasn't all that civilized, was it? So, I mean, it's, this is really short-lived that we've had this high intelligence thing, this control, this machine world, okay? We, we had, yeah, we invented a clock, and we, you know, invented a canal, and a few other, you know, one little, little thing to hold the roof up and shit. But, yeah, we really hadn't done much until a couple hundred years ago. This thing really took off, this intelligence thing. And now we really have some kind of measure of power. And yeah, look what we're doing with it. Seven billion people, n in insufficient resources, and we can't even politically discuss the idea of birth control. We can't even politically discuss it. What kind of weird war will we invent in the next couple thousand years? I mean, this is not, not sustainable. 
And yet, as it's a life form, you know, life form ought to be sustainable that long. I certainly think that DNA, if it were to be said to have expectations, would expect us to make it longer in a couple thousand years longer. No other organism is really using external tools to any measure that we are. Okay, their DNA is controlling how long their teeth are, how good, big their ears are, how, how good their personal tools are. So the DNA doesn't have reach. So the DNA can't control uh, what we're building outside of ourselves. It can't stop us from making a nuclear bomb. It just doesn't have the ability to stop it from happening. So 100,000 to be considered a success. Okay, so it's given us this brain which can help us over this threshold. You, you don't deny that. You have ideas to help us over this threshold that you've done with your brain. You just think that your brain's outsmarted the DNA. But I don't understand. It's not outsmarted the DNA. The DNA was, is too stupid to be outsmarted. It has no smart. How can I outsmart something that has no smart at all? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like winning a race against something with no arms and legs. I mean, it's, yes, uh, you know, uh, obviously I, I can, I can, I can even beat a fucking uh, plankton in a spelling bee. Even though I'm a dismal speller, I can beat a plankton. What it really is that you think the DNA can do quote-unquote wants. Because you know, we create our own, you know, to me, all of the agendas possible are out there in nature. All right, there's not all the agendas possible, blah, 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 blah. The agenda is consumption and reproduction with no cause, no balance, no regard for how much suffering is paid for the um, orgasmic pleasure. It uses things like addiction, desire, passion to control, to, to obligate organisms to, to ignore their intelligence if they have any and keep marching through it to compel them to create intense motivation that is counterintuitive to the intelligence. You know, I know we, we use those words in the reverse manner, but intelligence informs us that this is stupid. That's what intelligence is going to say. Our passion is going to keep saying, no, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's magnificent, I must touch it, I must feel it, I must have it. That's the dilemma. We create areas and, and find areas where it's kind of like having a garden. Having a garden is really nice. The jungle is nice, but having a garden it can be even nice if you're really good. You know, maybe it makes it a little jungle in there's my particular flavor. But let's just say a garden. A gardener can take an area and make it real nice. I mean, walk in the forest, okay, it's all kind of beautiful. But in terms of having a like, touching garden kind of quality, it, it, most of it isn't like that. Sometimes you walk up to the top of a hill and there's a little knoll or you, know, you come into a meadow and it's just an idyllic place. You know, it has this kind of feel that you're going for if you're trying to create a garden. The, the magic of gardening is wherever you yeah, this idyllic feel, again, again, we're back to this concept of how does it feel? That's how we measure its value. What, does it, what, what part of us does it rub the right way? Which one of our, our crude ape and lizard sensibilities does it tweak just right? And that's how we're defining its value, and that's the, the imbecility of the circumstance. The, 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 the value's got to be done, the, the value equation's got to be processed by the, the most capable instrument to process it, which is the objective intelligence. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's just silly. No, it's not silly. Silly's one word, sorry. Um, but yeah, this metaphor that there's some way we can tweak it. I mean, I've made the argument that yes, we can, we can make this a lot safer. We can, we can make it fail safe and we can take a substantial amount of the conscious suffering out of the equation by going into a virtual reality. And that that to me is probably the safest and best place for consciousness to exist. But you've seen what happens when you even just, you get another subject you can't even rationally talk about with people. They don't get it. They don't get why it's necessary. And they, they can't figure out why it optimizes our circumstance. Why there is logic to having that garden by, by structuring the environment and optimizing the environment. They're just going to keep saying nature, nature, nature. Is there, that's what they're horny for. That's what they've been conditioned to think is their mother. Perhaps it is, you know, to some restrictions. I think you can try to recreate this sort of environment. Okay? But they happen naturally in nature. And that's what I think is good about nature. Is these good examples. Those, those environments, those circumstances, they don't really happen in nature. Those are just superficial. Okay, it's like great text on the beach the other day. Yeah, it's superficially pleasant. But we know if we scratch at it, we pick at it, we can find the flaws in it. It's not a perfect holodeck. It's a flawed, very flawed, fake image. It's a limited perception. It is not a complete and honest picture of the reality. Examples are out there. And there's bad examples, too. You know? And so that's the sense when, in which nature... You know, it's beyond good and evil, doesn't have a gender, it isn't saying that the good ones are good and the bad ones. <coughs> good and evil, see this is, a, this, is a, this is another piece of something held over in our culture, this idea that we put these two words together, good and evil, when they're really not the same thing. There's good and bad, or there's pleasant and unpleasant, all right, but this idea that the opposite of good is evil, now we're applying intent. Like if we can have something that's good and it could be a value equation, it has nothing to do with it. It's intent. It just has to do with the quality of it. All right? It's well made, so it's good. It's poorly made, you don't say it's evil. <laughs> you just say it's deficient, it's inefficient, it's um, uh, bad, flawed, broken. So it should be good and broken. So if we use those kind of metaphors, it's going to be a lot easier to look at nature and call it broken. You're bad. It's just saying, here they all are. But it does end up creating these good spots, which we can then go and learn the principles of. And we can make our spots good, wherever they may be. Again, the good is this superficial, rose-colored glasses, um, you know, fog, foggy image of the reality. And that's why you can find the good, is because you're not picking at the details. You're not revealing the dirt, the skeleton, the smell, the stench. You've taken out its reality, and you're just qualifying it because you've you, 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 you've taken out, you've erased, you've bludgeoned away, you've filtered out um, what you could see if you wanted to see it. And we can expand the goodness in nature in that way. Yeah, that's how I think we get ahead of the game. And it's not a way of DNA, though. I mean, the tools I'm going to do this with is this amazing Swiss Army knife given me by my DNA. I mean, it's given Again, Swiss Army knife that we put in the hands of a monkey and a lizard. The intelligence is not using the Swiss Army knife. The monkey's using it. The lizard's using it. So it's just a fucking lethal weapon in the hands of a maniacal lunatic. Super complicated computer complex that was given by the DNA. I could I just there's nothing but there's no feeling that's appropriate but, but thankfulness. 
again, a feeling of thankfulness. I mean, really, that, that doesn't even work. I mean, thankfulness is more of an idea. And it's usually something based on a principle. I mean, you're thankful because you understand that somebody did some good for you or they extended some effort. It's really not a feely thing. Um, so whatever. And the idea that you would be grateful to a crude force that created an ad ad addict who is part of a seven billion strong loony race of, of reproducing monstrous Frankensteins that are on the verge of um, causing huge toxic um, destruction to an environment that will cause untold harm and nastiness to sentient beings for untold millennium. Um, yeah, that's not exactly something to be thankful for. I'm not very happy to be part of it. <laughs> no, not happy at all. But that's my destiny, to be one of the monsters, one of the little Frankensteins that um, had the potential to do something and instead gave the army knife to a dumb fucking monkey. Yeah. <laughs> the end. Yeah, that was fun. So, good video. Till next time. Thanks for the conversation. But it probably is pointless.